That story you just heard never happened. That never happened? Well, we'll get, it will get cut off in editing, right? right. Hey, hey, everybody, I'm it Jordan. Will. And I'm Austin. Uh, we're here for part two of networking. That's we covered right. part one last week. If you haven't watched it, I recommend you go through and watch it. We have some fantastic Microsoft Paint drawings. That's right. Uh, we've upgraded our, our art medium this time. Yes, we've gone from paint to lucid chart. I think we're doing just fine in terms of the art uh, department here. But um, Okay, so we're going to just jump into introductions again. For anyone who wasn't here last time, my name's Austin. Uh, I have done networking for the last six, seven years, um, and uh, I was hired on by PDQ to be the network engineer out as soon as I got out of the military. Um, I've also done some consulting work on the side, uh, so I, I'm very familiar with these with these topics. Uh, we're going to do a rough uh, TLDR of what we talked about last time. Uh, we talked about the OSI layers and what those mean uh, uh, in terms of networking when we're talking about layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, uh, just referencing what technologies those mean. We also talked about properties of network traffic in terms of uh, broadcast, multicast, uh, unicast. Uh, we talked a little bit about MTU uh, and what that means in terms of uh, actual networking. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next segment of uh, networking. If you don't. So, yeah, so my understanding is it's best to just have everything broadcast everywhere. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, don't don't even have a network okay. and hand deliver all envelopes uh, of information to everyone. Uh, if anyone knows the RFC for the avian, avian carrier off the top of their head, let me know because that's the best RFC I've ever heard. So, um, all right, we're going to go ahead and jump into segmentation and interface properties, right? So last time we talked, uh, we talked about broadcast domains, right? Do you remember what that means by chance, Jordan? Yes, so broadcast domain will hit every device connected to a switch, as I understand it. Right, so it, it would be if a broadcast is sent from one device, who will receive that broadcast, right? That's where you would draw your broadcast domain. Uh, so when somebody's talking about um, segmentating a broadcast domain, uh, we're usually talking about VLANs, right? And VLANs are very common uh, terminology. I'm sure when I say VLAN, it isn't foreign to you. Uh, but what I'm going to do is just kind of describe it here a little bit. Uh, so what you want, it, in most cases, you don't want one huge uh, VLAN, right? Uh, it's just unfeasible for some large networks. Uh, it works in most cases uh, for smaller networks, but we're going to uh, assume that this network that we're looking at on the screen right here uh, requires more than one VLAN, right? So what this is emulating is a lab I'll pull up later, but we've got switch four, switch two, PC one, and PC two, right, on this screen. Uh, if you were to turn on the computers, turn on the switches, uh, in, in Cisco world, uh, my favorite world, right next to Disney world, uh, we talk about that the default VLAN is VLAN one, right, which means that there is no VLANs uh, uh, created by, by default. Uh, these PCs can talk to each other through these switches, uh, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? So uh, what we, the reason you'd want a VLAN uh, in most scenarios is to reduce your broadcast traffic. Uh, it's, it's very noisy when you have, uh, if, if you've ever seen a network larger than a slash 24, uh, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of hosts, right? Uh, if you start getting into thousands of hosts uh, sending broadcasts, and it's not every second, it's, it, sometimes it can be milliseconds, uh, consumes a lot of bandwidth on those interfaces. Um, it can affect QoS, or excuse me, it can affect traffic that is sensitive to latency and bandwidth, right? So those would be voice, cameras. Uh, so it's one of those, in a small environment, it matters less, but as you grow, there's just so much traffic that maybe you're not accounting for that breaking it up into parts right. makes it work better. Well, like, a, like my explanation uh, last week, uh, it's, it, you can have all your documents on your desktop, but there becomes a point when it gets annoying to try to find them. So it may be easier to segment those documents into subcategories, right, like folders. Uh, so that's what VLANs are also useful for. I find them very useful for just categorizing uh, traffic based on the device that you want to uh, group into. So like you have printer VLANs, you have user VLANs, you have voice VLANs, uh, these kind of things. Uh, also helps with security in the sense, and I'm not, I'm not saying VLANs are inherently secure, just because uh, you separate a broadcast domain does not mitigate any risk that could be that could happen to these clients. What I'm saying is you could apply security to those VLANs uh, based on uh, subnets uh, and uh, ACLs, all this good stuff, right? 
So we're going to go through a little lab here. This is, this is my favorite part. Uh, let's say your boss said that this isn't working. They want, they, oh, you just have so much broadcast traffic. For some reason, he comes up to you and says that randomly, All right? Between these, between these uh, two switches, in fact, we're going to do this. We are going to do this right here. We're going to just say that these are connected to the same switch right here. He says, on this one switch, I want two VLANs. I want PC2 on VLAN 500, and I want PC1 to remain on VLAN 1, right? So if you were looking at a topology like this, this is what we're kind of emulating here. I'll go ahead and delete this. And if you're curious what this, this is, this is GNS3. Uh, you can Google that if you are ever curious about labbing some of these uh, technologies yourself. We'll go ahead and do G11. OK, so on switch four, implement two VLANs, right? I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Cisco. Uh, we're not going to go into too much terminology in terms of the CLI or anything like that. But uh, I'll, in most cases and most vendors, this is typically how it's done, right? So we're going to go ahead and enable. We're going to go ahead and go into our configuration terminal. And to create a VLAN, it's the craziest command I've ever seen in my life. You type the VLAN. Say VLAN 500, right? I like to give little names. We're going to say PDQ is the name. Now That's the best VLAN then. That's right. I think the most important traffic rides on that VLAN. Uh, but what we're going to do is, in terms of Cisco, the VLAN isn't applied until you exit the VLAN configuration just like this, right? Now, from here, uh, you can say, I want to look at all my VLANs real quick. Uh, there are some pre-existing VLANs here. This is a lab that I work on myself, so ignore VLANs 2 and 23. But you can see VLAN 500 is right there. It just does not have any ports assigned to it. Uh, so how do we assign uh, computers to ports? Well, we're going to go ahead and take a look at our our, our little uh, topology here. Uh, we're going to say that interface G2, G02 is connected to that uh, computer, which it is. And then we're going to say, go into. You have to go into the interface, right? Switch port. So while you're doing that, since the ports are all on that one switch, does that mean VLANs are limited to a single device, or can you span that across multiple? Yeah, you definitely can. Uh, you can definitely span VLANs. We'll go ahead and talk about that in just a moment, okay. though, for sure. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, just a little bit. You're just you're too ahead of the game. It's it's amazing, actually. It's but always the problem. I know too much. <laughs> so uh, in in Cisco land, to assign a uh, VLAN to an interface, you say switch port access, VLAN, and we created 500, right? Uh, in Cisco land, also, interfaces are access ports. What that means is that there is no trunking, which we'll also get to later, uh, on that interface. When a frame comes in on that interface, it will be assigned to that VLAN internally to the switch. The client does not have to be aware of that VLAN, uh, and it usually never is, unless you, you are implementing some Darwin Q. Okay. Did I see you do tab complete? Because now we're getting to PowerShell territory. I might be into this networking stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've got a, you've got a uh, tab complete. Ooh. Uh, you've got uh, question marks. Uh, so <laughs> we're getting some uh, CDP issues here. So I may have picked the wrong interface, which I totally did. That That's okay. Oh, no, because I think the top interface is just looking at. So that, I guess, can you pull up that uh, yeah. chart again? There's two interfaces tied to that, or am I misreading it? So there's GI0 and GI1. They so I made, I made a goof here. G02 is this. Oh, oh okay. So is this right interface right here? So, so you tried to try tie the other switch to the VLAN then? Right. Oh, so okay. when, to give some context to that CDP error, if you have two Cisco devices and they're connected to each other and one device is a, has a VLAN assigned on an interface that the other device does not, CDP will recognize that and notify you via the logs, which is what we're receiving here in Switch 4. CDP is Cisco's proprietary discovery protocol. If you want to know more about that, uh, that's an easy Google lookup right there. But uh, we're going to just pretend that I did not do that. So oh, it's been recorded. That's forever. I know. I'm sorry. So we're going to say no, which is like deleting a command on, a, uh, on an interface or, or deleting a command that you'll preface it with no, right, mm. uh, in Cisco world. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to the actual correct interface. I believe that's G11. Doo -doo -doo. So interface G11, 
switch port access VLAN 500. Uh, we'll go into what else I'm doing here in just a moment. Uh, switch port mode access. We're also statically setting this interface to uh, an access port. Uh, Cisco says it's dynamic. Technically, yes, but we'll, we'll uh, again, we'll get into this when we start getting into trunking and what, what all of this means. And then we're going to say switch port no negotiate. Again, we'll talk about this in just a moment. But uh, if we were to send a broadcast frame from PC1, we're going to use DHCP, right? DHCP is, uh, is a broadcast technology in every subnet. Um, so we're, we're watching these uh, discovery frames uh, come out of this uh, computer. We're going to go ahead and look here. Now, if you want to verify where this client exists and what VLAN, I like to show Mac address with not two C's. This isn't this isn't thick with two C's. We're talking about Mac addresses here. Um, so, as you can see, interface GI11 uh, is a, has a Mac address. There's a Mac address of the client it starts with 0050, uh, and it is VLAN 500. So, we have set now segmented the two clients from each other. If that, that DHCP packet was never received by the client on VLAN 1. Um, so it, in, in Cisco world, this is how you would do it. Uh, and it also gives a little example as to uh, what it would look like in the CLI if you wanted to do that. All right. So on VLAN, right now we're setting everything specifically to ports. So does that mean Wi-Fi is not enabled for VLANs, or is there something that you can do to make that Oh, work? yeah, uh, for sure. So if you're working on uh, wireless uh, networks uh, in Cisco world, we're, we're going to stay here in Cisco land. Uh, you can assign an AP or uh, uh, SSIDs, right, to VLANs. So let's say you have guest SSID and you have employee SSID. And let's say guest is VLAN 1, whereas employee is VLAN 500. That is assigned either in the AP normally, or it's assigned via the controller. Uh, in, in most scenarios, it's by the controller. If, you've ever, if anyone's here ever worked with the Unify line of products, um, I'm sure you're familiar with a controller, uh, but basically it just uh, assigns configurations to multiple APs, right? But yes, SSIDs can be VLAN aware, uh, but that's where we're going to get into trunking here because you will have to assign a trunk to that AP port in order for it to actually function correctly. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. Now that we're at trunking, uh, so let's say this. Your boss says, ah, I just moved that computer. What the heck? Why can't I get the VLAN 1 from this switch right here? We're going to say G11 again. Okay. He says, ah, I need to be able to reach what's on PC2 from PC1. Why isn't that happening? As the smart network engineer you are, you know why. You're not spanning VLAN 500 across these two switches on our left here. Um, how would you do that? Do you have any idea, Jordan? Well, you said trunking. So yeah, I'm yes, there you go. That. There you go. Easy, <laughs> easy. So when I slow down, Jordan's busy drinking. I, I, <laughs> on, I knew that was trunking because of context clues. <laughs> you, you'd be a good test taker. <laughs> context clues. It's written in the outline. <laughs> <laughs> it's written in the outline. We don't have an outline in it anyone. It says here. Let's see. Uh, what are we talking about again? Oh, okay. Um, perfect. So when I'm saying trunking, this is uh, tagging Ethernet frames with a VLAN ID, right? Uh, Cisco has its own proprietary ISL, but we are in 2021, and nobody uses that anymore. So we're going to talk about .1Q. 802.1Q is a protocol that inserts a, uh, a, a little, I wouldn't call it a header, but a little insert into an Ethernet frame. And inside that insert, if you were to chop it up and then expand it, it would uh, have the VLAN ID inside. Uh, so any .1Q aware device can uh, assign traffic based on that VLAN ID within, within the packet, right, or within the Ethernet header. Um, so we've got switch four and switch two here, right? We're going to pick an interface that connects the two of them. Using CP, like I just talked about, we can see who our neighbors are. Oh, crazy. Switch and switch. I, uh, beats me. And I, just kidding. They're both the uh, switch two in this scenario. We're on switch four. We're looking at switch two here. I'm going to pick interface G03. Just kidding. You have to be in configuration terminal. Don't, don't do an OS in there. Uh, interface G03. And then in Cisco world, you would say switch port access. Excuse me, 
switchboard mode, trunk. Oh, look at that. That's crazy. Well, it's saying that because these switches are old. The image is old, or they want you to lab with it. Anyways, the Cisco, I believe it's ISL. It's their old proprietary trunking protocol. Yeah, I'm not even going to teach you here because it would be irrelevant to the topic. Uh, so what they want you to do is say switchboard trunk encapsulation dot one Q. Boom, and now you can say, using the up arrow, I'll go back and say switchboard mode trunk. So the Cisco switches make you say we're not using your technology. Yeah, it, a real Cisco switch, uh, like a anything after, I don't know, a 2960X and, and on isn't going to actually do that. They've gotten rid of ISL okay. as a trunking protocol. It's just inefficient. Uh, if, you want the, if you want a, a networking breakdown, I'm sure that somebody's ranting on a blog online about how it sucks. Uh, so... Go ahead and do that if you're curious. But uh, we're also going to say non-negotiate here. And I'll give some context, context as to why that's happening. So Cisco has a protocol, dynamic trunking protocol, right? It can detect that two switches are connected to each other. And it will assume that you want to create a trunk port between the two of them. In most scenarios, when you have two switches connected together, you're going to want to span VLANs, right? So what's happening dynamically is this. At these links here... There's a protocol being ran, DTP, right? What it does is it tries to form or, or tries to discover other Cisco devices. And then on these interfaces right here, oh, man, oh, goodness gracious. So it turns out Microsoft Paint wasn't the cause of the bad art. No, it's, uh, it's my shaky hands. Oh, okay. uh, it's, it's user. <laughs> yeah, it is user error. But on those interfaces that connect the two switches together, they will form dynamic trunks. Uh, I don't like dynamic uh, as a network engineer, I don't like things that are dynamically done uh, just by plugging it in. Uh, you'll get discussion through uh, VT VTP, the VLAN trunking protocol. People don't like it because they don't like things happening by just plugging in a device. Uh, I'd struggle with that because with what I do, everything that can be automated should, should be automated. It so, should be. So moving away from that would be a struggle for me. So what I would say is that you want automation. You would want autom automation right here, right? The, okay. the, that's where your highest activity is going to be, is where clients are constantly connecting and disconnecting, all that good stuff, right? Uh, but this, these, these uh, interfaces here should, in theory, rarely be touched. You'll set them up one time and then never touch them again. So what I like to do is the infrastructure ports or infrastructure technology is a one-and-done thing, very static, right? Okay. Um, obviously, protocols can be dynamic within them, but you want to avoid somebody just being able to come in and plug a switch in using DTP to grab, oops, a uh, to grab a trunk port from your switch, and then uh, if if let's say they have some, let's say you're running VTP and they have VTP enabled, now they know every uh, VLAN you're running, they can assign certain PCs to it. It's just very uh, ill-advised in my in my case I would uh, Austin recommended Austin certified you can stamp that uh, if I'm wrong feel free to correct me right, so the, the backbone the core of your network you want to set yourself have full control everything that's user they have less control over you without uh, right. dynamic then I would love uh, dynamic VLANs are, are a saint uh, uh, using radius you can you can do some of these technologies but we're gonna go ahead and jump right back onto trunking right so uh, on switch 4 We've created a trunk facing switch to G002, I believe is where we were here. Just verifying G03, excuse me. So, same thing happens here. You enable config T. I think config T is the only thing I remember from my networking degree. That's right. 15 years ago. Config T, enable, what else? Ah, I, I love Cisco. It's education, there's money well spent. That's right, that's right. Uh, so, Switch port, trunk, encapsulation, dot one Q. Switch port, mode, oops, mode, trunk. Switch port, non-negotiate. Boom, and then we're gonna exit here. We have to create the VLAN over here, unless you're using VTP, which I say, ugh, but. So you gave it the same number designation, do you have to give it the same name where you named it PDQ on the first switch? No, that's just internal. Okay. That's, so that's just for your sake. Uh, okay, so, in, so 500 and 500 will be just fine. The naming doesn't matter. Right. As long as the VLAN is there, VLAN 500, I'm going to name it PDQ, and we're going to go ahead and end right here. 
So if I do show interface trunk, we can see that we are spanning that VLAN across G03 to this, uh, to this client. So uh, let's go ahead and switch to quickly G11 interface G11. Jeez Louise. I thought you were professional. I, I am nervous, though. That, oh, it kind of right. ruins the, uh, the nah, speed there. I'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Push for access. Oh, my goodness. VLAN. 500, and then we're going to say switch port mode access, switch port non-negotiate. All right, easy, easy peasy. Now, if I send, we can go ahead and use GNS3 to start a packet capture on this interface. I, by the way, if you ever want to get into GNS3 or uh, what's the other one? Uh, they say it's better. I prefer GNS3. It's totally worth it. If you want to get into networking, uh, I think it's a great idea. We're going to go ahead and say no thanks. So on these ones, PC2 still isn't a part of VLAN 5, 500, right? So they shouldn't be able to communicate even though the trunk's there because they're VLAN associated. Correct, separate. yeah. Okay. So I believe if we go to interface... GI02. Do you remember the commands off the top of your head? Not even close. It's okay. It's, it's all, all good. Uh, this is a this is the day to day switch port access. VLAN 500. Switch port mode access. Switch port non negotiate. Just a reminder: switch port non negotiate disables DTP, the dynamic trunking protocol, which is a good thing. I was about to actually to give you that exact list of commands. I just. It's okay. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and send some DHCP packets on this network. Boom. And I believe we're viewing this guy down here. Uh, he captured nothing. Sad. <laughs> well. All right, I mean, unless I'm misunderstanding the setup, computer one and computer two still shouldn't be able to talk by broadcast at this point. Where they're on. No, they definitely, they definitely should be able to. In fact, I think if we go into switch four... And show MAC address. Uh, two C's. I don't know why I'm stuck on that double C life, but... Uh, Typing live is always different. This is true. This is true. Let's see what we got wrong here. What do we have wrong here? G11, G03. All right. Oh, while you're troubleshooting that, do we want to take a question? Yeah, let's do it. All right, are you ready, guys? Yep. Here we go. I'm getting the network path is not found on all machines that are connected to our VPN. Is this normal? Is there a way to clean that up so I can talk to machines that are on the VPN? Aaron H. So my initial guess, where I'm not a networking person, but I'd say maybe there's an issue with your DNS at that point where it's not updated. You might see that issue, but that's, yeah. that's a complete non-networking guess. Yeah, if I were to take a networking shot of this, um, I'm going to use an example. Uh, our VPN, if I were to have a VPN connected to a firewall and then use uh, some SSL application that they use, uh, normally that, that uh, subnet is defined in the firewall and then routing within your infrastructure knows that in order to reach that SSL subnet, you have to uh, go through certain paths, right? Uh, so like in this in this case, if we're looking back on my lucid chart right here, uh, let's say you have a VPN connected to doo -doo -doo, to uh, switch two like this, right? Let's say switch two is actually firewall two. In fact, if I just change, oh my goodness, boom, firewall two. There's no PC connected. Actually, we'll go ahead and do it like this. Yeah. I, I missed the notepad. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't miss the notepad. I, I, I love it. Let's say PC2 is off the VPN, right? Uh, let's say there's a subnet between Firewall 2 and Switch 4, or let's say there isn't. Let's say Firewall 2 owns the subnet for this, all this down here, right here. Uh, so does your PDQ console know how to reach the VPN clients is my first question. Um, uh, so it seems like... Based on the chat, what always happens in there, we, we guess randomly, and then whoever's phone a friend, in this case, Katie, 
puts the answer in a in a link. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> Just uh, exercising my Google cert over here. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Uh, you can also reference that documentation, but it sounds like there may be some uh, there may be some routing issues going on there. Uh, but without full knowledge of your of your enterprise or your network topo topology, it's very hard for me to just kind of shoot in the dark there. Um, so I apologize if that's not what the answer you're looking for. But um, anyways, so I, thank I, you. I'm sure I'm sure you got it. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, reference the documentation. Make sure that PDQ console can reach other VPN clients. Uh, it, and uh, I, I wish the best of luck to you, my friend, as a fellow network engineer. Yeah, well, I mean, he said thanks. That means he nailed it. <laughs> oh, perfect. I give I would give all credit to Austin, half half credit to Katie. <laughs> perfect. I'll take my half a point. <laughs> you go on another question, or yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right. Well, this one's actually for me. Why aren't your sessions recorded for replay anymore? Sincerely, C Via Nueva. They actually are, but you can find them on our YouTube channel. All of the uh, webcasts that we record are archived on the YouTube channel. They're searchable, and uh, yeah, go there. They're under a different tab, though, now. Are they? Did they get moved? So there, there's a tab for our regular videos, and then there's a tab that says Live, and you click on that, and it has all of our archived live sessions. Um, so th they are there. Um, I wonder if they're looking for it on the actual live.pdq.com. Yeah, I they think they probably were. Uh, yeah. Just have go been, to been used to our old, very old platform that we had before. Could be, yeah. But just subscribe to the pdq.com YouTube, and they're, they're all there. Well, it's important to me that those are available because I deliver pure gold week after <laughs> Every week. Every week. And the people deserve... <laughs> They deserve to see this. It was only a matter of time before Jordan had a diva moment. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Do you know who I am? <laughs> don't you know who I think I am? Yeah. I, I don't. Sorry. <clears throat> nah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. All right. Sweet. We carry right. on? Yeah, let's do it. So nothing changed here. Uh, GNS3 is not, uh, it does not emulate switches very well, I will admit. Uh, so I guess it, we either were missing frames or something. But as you can see here, we're on switch four. We're not, we're seeing the MAC address from PC1 from Switch 4, which means that broadcast uh, frame from DHCP is reaching us on Switch 4, which definitely means it reach, is reaching the client, right? So that, that's a basic uh, rundown of trunking or dot, dot one q or what, whatever you want to call it, uh, tagging VLANs within an Ethernet header, let's say that. Um, so... Did, did you have any questions? Oh, well, just this is now that we have the, the trunking down. The, the last place I worked, the network engineer had set it up based on we were in a rather large building. Yeah. And floor and like corner of the floor would be a certain VLAN. So if you went over there, if you plugged in or grabbed an IP from there, yeah. all the printers or network shares you might need based on being in the accounting corner yeah. would automatically be added. Is it? Something we could do is this have to be combined with group policy or can networking? Oh yeah, it's got to be combined. Networking, uh, the, I mean, it, uh, just with trunking dot one q, you're not going to get that kind of. So awesome networking makes group policy just that much more powerful. Right. The networking uh, is the foundation of a good enterprise, a good uh, uh, network, obviously. But uh, yes, the you have to have a, a good understanding of networking in order to build off of it using group policy or however however you want to implement that. Um, but yeah, you can get as granular as you want on your VLANs. I highly recommend separating VLAN or devices based on device type using VLANs, right? Um, try to not have a huge slash 21 on your network. It's, I've never seen that before, ever. Anyways. He made eye contact. I'm feeling judged. <laughs> it's, uh, I wish Josh was here. That's all I can say. But, uh, <laughs> Um, oh, I'm a Josh proxy. Yeah, so you are. <laughs> I got smarter, everybody. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go into another topic. How are we doing on time? Are we all right? We are at uh, 1029, so we're right near the end. We have a couple questions in the queue, slightly unrelated, but uh, we can get to them when, you, uh, when you're when you done. Okay, so the next topic is spanning tree, and that in itself could be a, a, could be a whole video. So <laughs> I think this is a good stopping point for this. All right. All right, let's take rapid-fire questions Maybe then. we'll yep. end up doing a part three. Who knows? Let's do it. 
All right, here we go. Guys, how do you convert WMI time to standard time in a WMI scanner? Sincerely, LB. Uh, so, depending on what you're querying in WMI, the, the timer might be different. There's a lot of ways in PowerShell, but if you look at the WMI scanner that you are grabbing for however they have their date time, you should be able to research that to find out in PowerShell how to convert that. It's just it can be different based on whatever you're querying. Whatever he said. He's the pro. No, we're in PowerShell territory now. That's right. You are the boss in PowerShell territory. I'm not, but people believe it. You are Big Daddy PowerShell, and I will not I will not and and intro encroach on that. Enroach. All right, next question. Next question, which uh ooh, it was our final, but uh someone just snuck another one in there. Guys, is there a way to find the last day a specific application on a user machine was opened or used? Sincerely, IB. Uh, accurately would be very difficult. You might be able to do like a PowerShell scan where you're going in to find out the last time that uh, executable was run, but I don't know how, I mean, you're playing a guessing game at that point. It might be accurate. It might be missing some things, but that's the closest I can think of is based on information from that specific execu executable with a get uh, child item. Exactly. What right. he said. And we have one last question. Gentlemen, do you have any blogs on VLANs? Most people cannot explain VLANs very well, and it would be great to have a reference when I need it once in a blue moon. Sincerely, J Dog Davis. So I don't know of any currently that we have, but I do know uh, we've talked about doing an entire networking series in videos. I would love to. Where um, we could have a specific video just on VLANs. Yeah, we could. We've got a whole, I don't know if you've seen this, we've got a whole outline. Uh, and uh, I would love to uh, either do it in videos or blog posts, however you guys would like to receive that information. Probably both. Uh, Austin, how are your writing skills? Uh, I can write good. Yes. <laughs> so, good. He, he can use words good, everybody. I, I use words good. Jordan can write well, but Austin can write good. That's right. And I hear Brock is great at writing uh, articles. He's he's a pro at it. So well, he's, he's a machine. Like, he takes materials that he's learning on the fly and writes so good. He, he writes gooder than me, that's for sure. <laughs> More gooder. I just did that to kill JJ at this point. <laughs> All, All right, guys, I think that's about it for today. Yeah. All right. All right, uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hopefully yeah. this gave you, like, the next phase in your troubleshooting if you're working on your network. Yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you didn't fall asleep, uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. For PDQ, I'm Jordan. And I'm Austin. Thanks for joining our webcast today. Congratulations, Aaron H. and C. Villanueva, winners of PDQ Swag. Just send us your info at webcast at pdq.com. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you back here next week.